I'm so glad that you're here today and I'm gonna shift gears because those of you who know, who talk with me much, you know that I, my conversation always turns to music, right? And um, so I was wondering, what is your favorite soundtrack from, move, from a movie? Your favorite soundtrack. There are a lot of great soundtracks. Some of them are the best-selling albums in, in history. And I, I'm, a few of my favorites, as I was thinking through my favorites, would be um, Footloose, okay? Uh, Saturday Night Fever, Grease is the word. Forrest Gump soundtrack, maybe the Big Chill, the Motown stuff is so good. Uh, some people might say the Bodyguard soundtrack. Um, there's, a, there's a new movie coming out in about two weeks, April the 24th, called Unsung Hero. It's sort of a, a biopic about, um, this is Scott for King and Country, if you know that band. And the soundtrack's pretty good. And so I wanted to kind of give a plug for that. But um, as I think about the songs of the soundtracks, I think about the soundtrack of my life. Those soundtracks not only made the movies better, but, but uh, a lot of those songs have become the soundtrack of my life. And it's interesting how you just hear a song or a part of a song and it has the power to take you back to that moment and that place and time. Uh, I actually remember the song that was playing when I was nine years old in the car as a lady was taking me to school, a song by a Christian hippie folk singer. Um, the song was called Maranatha Marathon. And um, I, I just remember that as, and she asked me this riddle. She said, she said, what book has mystery, romance, poetry, action and adventure, battles, wars, and fighting, murder, history, prophecy, comedy, tragedy, drama, and biography, all in the same book. And since I was sitting in a car and not sitting in church, I was like, I don't know, that sounds like an amazing book. What, what book are you talking about? I couldn't figure it out. She's talking about the Bible. Really, the Bible is not just one book, but a collection of 66 books that were written over a period of 1,600 years by 40 different authors on three different continents in three different languages. The Bible was written by poets and prophets, by princes and kings, by sailors and soldiers, by lawyers and doctors. It was written by prisoners and prophets. It was written by normal, everyday people. Some of the Bible was written in a cave. Some of it was written on boats. Some of it was written in prison and some of it was written in palaces. And it all tells one overarching, big, cohesive story. If you have your Bible with you today, I hope that you do, open your, well, take your Bible and just open it up to the center of your Bible. Unless you got a lot of study notes at the back of your Bible or at the bottom of your Bible, you open it up and you're probably most likely pretty close to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible and um, it has um, 176 verses and you'll never believe what this chapter is about. It's about the Bible. Yeah. Of course, the book of Psalms is a sort of spiritual soundtrack. It's a collection of songs that were sung to God, like, like a hymnal, hymn book, song book. And I'm gonna try as best I can to stick to this chapter today. We'll, we'll move out of it just a little bit, but we're gonna look mostly in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, 54 talks about the Bible being the theme of your life song. 
It says, your decrees are the theme of my song wherever I lodge. And um, I was just thinking about how many songs have been written out of the pages of the Bible, not just Christian songs, but many songs you hear. The Bible inspires so many songs that we enjoy. The Bible is the most read, translated, and best-selling book in all of history. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. The B-I-B-L-E stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. It is God's love letter to you. It is the owner's manual for your life. Some people have decided today that the Bible is just another book and you can't really trust it to be true. But I wanna show you why you can trust your Bible. You can tell the Bible is true because it was written by real people in real places doing real things that can be verified. Psalm 119, 142 says, your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. When you go to court, you know, the best kind of uh, evidence is an eyewitness. And the Bible was written by people who actually saw and experienced what was happening. Moses saw the burning bush and heard the voice of God speaking to him. Jesus' disciples saw him walking on the water. They saw him back from the dead. Luke, who was a doctor, he conducted personal interviews and did research for his writing. Some people would say, well, the Bible has got errors in it. Let me explain a little bit about, or we can think about how the scribes back in the day would copy the Bible. They didn't have like photocopiers, you know, they didn't have printing presses. So they copied them by hand and they had very strict rules that they would follow. They wouldn't copy word for word, but instead they would copy it, transfer it letter by letter. And they knew the exact number of letters in each book. And if they were one letter off, they would tear the whole thing up and start over again from scratch. In 1946, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And these Dead Sea Scrolls were written a hundred years before the time of Jesus. And they contain every book in the Old Testament except for the book of Esther. And before they were found, some of the earliest copies of these books were from nine, the year 900, which is 900 years after Jesus. So now we've got books that go back a thousand years before some of the earliest manuscripts that we had. And you would think that over a thousand year period, you could go back and you could compare and you could go, well, there, there, it's changed over a thousand years and there's all these differences, but it turned out that there were basically no differences over a thousand year period. And that only confirmed the reliability and how carefully the Bible was preserved. Also, archeologists have gone back and they can find the actual places that are talked about in the Bible. For example, historians weren't quite sure that King Solomon even lived and they were, they knew for certain that he didn't have horses because all they would do was ride around on camels back then. Then they discovered cities with thousands of horse stables at Megiddo. And this proved that what the Bible said about history was right all along. Some people say, well, what about science? Doesn't science disprove the Bible? No, actually it doesn't. See, science is simply the study of the natural world based on observation and experimentation. Of course, who created those consistent ways that science is based on? It was God. How many of you got to experience and witness the solar eclipse this week? Wasn't that awesome? It was so, so amazing, so incredible. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. 
A lot of times we can't see the heavens very clearly because the sun is so bright you can't see, but we were able to see the heavens and the skies in ways that we normally can't. And we were reminded that our universe is not just some random accident. It is so finely tuned that astronomers can know the exact location of the celestial bodies, the stars and the planets, and they know the exact location 300 years from now. That's because it was all set in place and in motion by a creator. Johannes Kepler, he's a famous German mathematician and astronomer. He said this, science is simply thinking God's thoughts after him. See, God set up all the laws of physics and biology and mathematics and science, and then we come along and we discover them. The science though is never settled. Science changes. When I, back, you know, a few, a while back when I was born, uh, mamas were told to uh, sleep their babies on their tummies. That was the way, that was the safe way to do it. When Pam and I had our two daughters, we were told by the doctors to sleep our babies on their sides. And we had these little props that you would prop them up in so they wouldn't flip around. And then not long after that, they started saying, no, you need to lay your baby on its back so that, you know, that's the best way. And that's, I believe, how it is today until they say something different. The science is never really totally settled, but God's truth never changes. Back in the day when uh, the Bible was written, for example, Moses, he was taught in the greatest schools in Egypt. And what they believed back then about the world, they believed that the world was held up on these big pillars, but they're not, it's not. And so that didn't make it in the Bible when Moses was writing down the, you know, the words in, in the Old Testament and he didn't put that in there because that's not true. For years, people believed an astrologer named Hipparchus his count of the stars. He said he counted the stars and that there were 1,022 stars in the sky. Now scientists say the universe has no end, that it's limitless. But 2,600 years ago, the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 33, 22, I will make the descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister before me as countless as the stars in the sky. And he was right on about that. People are never perfect. We rarely say the right thing, but God's word is always perfect. Psalm 119.96 says, nothing is perfect except your words. Some people will say, well, I don't really believe the whole Bible. What I believe is, those red letters, you know, the thing that Jesus said, I'm gonna believe that. But actually, every word in the Bible is Jesus's words. Second Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. About 10% of what Jesus said, he was quoting the Old Testament. He talked about, Adam and Eve. He talked about Jonah in the belly of a whale. He believed that the whole Bible is true. And his belief in the whole Bible is important for us to understand. In Matthew 5, 18, Jesus said this, I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. See, Jesus didn't treat the Bible just like another book. He said, it is true. It is powerful. It is life-changing. But sometimes we like to take our Bible and we like to go through it with the black highlighter. And we like to say, ah, I don't know about that one. I don't really care about that part of it. And it's all based on our own opinion. 
Well, Jesus trusted the whole Bible, so that's what I'm gonna do. Because if you just believe what you want, in the Bible and you don't believe what you don't like, you're not really trusting in God and his word, you're trusting in yourself. Uh, I once had this bumper sticker that said, it said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And I took it and I, I cut out the I believe it part because God said it, that settles it. And it's true whether or not I choose to believe it or not. The Bible's the most despised, denied, disputed, dissected, debated, and destroyed book in all of history. Millions of people have died because they held on to their Bible. The Bible today is still illegal or faces strict regulations in 52 different countries in our world. For example, if you take a Bible into North Korea, you'll get arrested, you'll get thrown in jail, and they might kill you. But still the most read book in the world. It's the most published book in the world. It's the most translated book in the world, and it's still making differences in people's lives today. Psalm 119, 152 says, long ago, I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. The Bible is the greatest source of music and art and culture and paintings throughout history. It's the source and it's the foundation of our culture that we live in. You cannot rip out the foundation from underneath and expect the whole structure to remain standing. It will crumble down. But God's word is unstoppable. Nothing can stop the word of God. In the 1700s, Voltaire, who was a genius French thinker who also happened to not believe in God, he said, in a hundred years from today, the Bible will be a forgotten book. How many of you remember his quote? Did you forget about that? Yeah. How about, nobody forgets about the Bible. But I will tell you above all how I know it's true because it changed my life and it's changed hundreds of thousands of others' lives by the truth and the power of the word of God. I have seen addicts set free when they read God's word and they believe God's word. I've seen the most selfish guys who misuse and abuse women who would rip somebody off just to make a buck. I've seen their lives powerfully changed when they get into the word of God. And we're in this series called Kickstart. We're talking about taking steps. So what step do we need to take when it comes to the Bible? We need to get into it. It's the soundtrack of your soul. And so just like your, your music player on your phone, you've got the buttons that say pause and play and shuffle and repeat. You do the same thing with your Bible. It's not complicated. You just, first, you just need a Bible. If you don't have one, we'll get you one. But we also have a Bible on our Connection Church app. It's right there. Some people say, well, isn't it cheating if you read it on your phone? No, no, it counts, okay? Now, I want you to have a physical Bible. Yes, but uh, come on. But, uh, but you... <laughs> It doesn't matter how you read it, just that you actually read it, okay? And the first button that we need to put, push on our player is to push the pause button because life goes by so fast. But every day, we need to push the pause button and take time and make time to spend with God in his word. There is a direct connection between your time spent in the word of God and your level of spiritual maturity in your life. That may mean for you, you need to get up a little bit earlier in the morning and you don't decide when you get up in the morning whether you're gonna push pause and spend time with God. You do that the night before, okay? Maybe you go to bed 15 minutes earlier. You set your alarm and uh, then when the alarm goes off, you don't hit the snooze button you know, five, seven times, like I know some of us do, right? You don't do that. You get up, you get up out of bed, you, you 
get into the word of God or else, you know, if you do it while you're in bed, what's gonna happen? You're just gonna roll over and fall back asleep, right? You go to a quiet place in your house, you go out on your porch, you focus in on God and you follow a plan. And we have a Bible reading plan you can follow on our church app. If you wanna follow it, it gives a passage for the day. It's under the Bible tab. And you need to follow a plan because you've heard it said, right? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail and we get discouraged and we give up. Don't do that. Get into the word and let him speak to you through his word. Psalm 119, 103 says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The Bible is soul food. You develop a taste for it, an appetite for it, where you start to have a desire to read the word of God. Our power verse for the week is in Psalm 119, 106. You got that card with you. We commit this to memory. This is a simple one. This is kind of a, a gimme this week, okay? Let's say it out loud with a lot of volume. Here we go. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. That's right. It's a lamp to guide my feet so I don't trip up and stumble. It is a light for my path so I know the direction and the decisions that I need to make. And you keep it there in your heart and your mind. You know, sin will either keep you from the Bible or the Bible will keep you from sin in your life. And it works by getting into God's word, reading it, praying to God, talking to God. It's also good to have a notebook, something to write in that you would take some notes and you, you could just kind of paraphrase in your own words, the Bible verse that you're reading, maybe ask God, what do I need to do with this in my life today? How do you want me to apply this to my life? You can write down prayer requests and answered prayers, but you don't just do this one day and forget about it. You do it consistently. That's why we need to press the repeat button where we meet with God each and every day because your life is the sum total of what you do daily on a consistent basis. What you do consistently begins to shape who you are. Isaiah 50 verse four says, the sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. Morning by morning, it's a daily thing in your life. Consistency is the key. There was this experiment that was done to see if a tiny piece of cork could, could move a large, heavy, eight-foot steel bar. And so they hung the steel bar on a cable, hung the cork on a little string, and they began consistently letting the cork go back and forth and hit the steel bar consistently like this. It just kept hitting and for 10 minutes, nothing happened. The steel bar didn't move. But after 30 minutes, that steel bar was swinging like a gigantic pendulum back and forth. How did that steel bar move? It was from the power of consistency. And that same thing can happen in your life when you have a consistent rhythm with God in your spiritual life, your life will take on that same incredible power and you'll move into a deeper connection with God. Because if you will let God fill up your life and your mind and your heart every day, whether or not you're feeling it or not, soon there's gonna be some big changes that happen in your life. You're gonna grow closer to God. You're gonna be becoming more like Jesus. You're gonna have a deeper sense of purpose in your life. Just like that little cork, your life will have incredible power. Listen, we don't need to just have the Bible in our houses or on our phones. We need to have the Bible in our hearts, in our minds. Psalm 119. 15 says, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. So he says, we need to meditate on it. Think about it. Christian meditation is different than the way the world thinks about meditation. Eastern religions, when they talk about meditating, a lot of times when people talk about meditating in our culture today, 
in our world today, they're talking about clearing your mind and thinking about nothing. That's not Christian meditation. Christian meditation is filling your mind with the word of God and thinking about it, thinking about what it means to your life and, and, and beginning to put it into practice. When you read the Bible, you're not just skimming over it. It's not a speed reading contest, okay? You're, you're going for quality over quantity. And, and you, you, you think about it, you begin to hide it in your heart. This comes from Psalm 119, 11 that says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. And at the Connection Church, we want to be people who are hiding God's word in our heart by memorizing it. That means consistently taking time to read it, thinking about it. Um, and, and over time, what happens, you'll be amazed. God's word gets in there into your life. And then when you're facing a crisis, you're facing a decision in your life, God's spirit has a way of bringing the right part of the Bible, the right verse into your mind to give you comfort, to give you guidance in your life. We're talking about the soundtrack of your soul, right? And when it comes to your favorite song, how many of you know your favorite song? Okay. You know, the melody, you know, the the, the sound, you know, the, the words to your favorite song. I love those games, you know, like what is it? Ask Shazam or name that tune. There's all kinds of those games. I love watching those, those games. Can you name that tune in five notes, right? Well, you can do the very same thing with the Bible. You begin to know it. You begin, a situation comes up and you go, that's, that's where it's at. That's how I apply that to my life. This verse in 119.11, it says, spending time in God's word, it will give you the wisdom and the strength and the motivation to make the right choices, the right decisions in your life. You'll start replacing common sense with God's wisdom. And really, if you wanna know what God thinks about a certain issue or a topic or maybe an event that's going on today, then what you can, one way, one hack I'll give you is you just get on social media, go to TikTok, go to Facebook or, or Instagram, and you just listen to what everybody's saying about that topic. And then you can pretty much know that God's opinion on it is totally opposite of what everybody else is saying, right? Okay, you will find God's will and you will find God's way when you get into God's word. And then you begin to play it out in your life. Press the play button. When you get it into your life, you will begin to experience freedom like nothing else. You'll begin to put it into practice in your life. You'll begin to hear his word. You'll begin to hear his voice in your life and your life will begin to change in ways that you never thought were possible. And this is possible in your life. And I wanna show you what happens when you consistently um, connect with God in his word. In Psalm 119, 165, it tells us, those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. You're gonna have peace in your heart. You're gonna have stability and security in your life when you begin to love the word of God. So if you normally get up in the morning and you just kind of rush into your day and you forget about God, I wanna challenge you to begin to set a different pace in your life this week. Start your day with God. Here's how I've seen it work in my own life. If I miss my time with God one day, God notices it. If I miss my time with God two days, I notice it. If I miss my time with God three days, everybody around me notices it. There's so many people today who are living powerless Christian lives. They wear the name of Christian but they're living distant and disconnected from God. Maybe they just check in with him every once in a while. Maybe they just check in with him on Sundays. But I want us to be people who are connecting with God every day and remembering and knowing that God is with you every moment of your life. You can begin that now, you can begin that this week. The step we're talking about today is to start walking between the lines of the word of God and living our life and continuing to follow him day 
by day for the rest of our lives. That's what Psalm 119.32 says. It says, I run in the path of your commands for you have broadened my understanding. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees that I may follow it to the end. Start following God. Start listening to his word, living it out. And don't stop. Keep following after him. God's word will change your life because Jesus is on every single page of the Bible. John 1.14 tells us the word became human and made his home among us. Jesus is the living word of God and he came into the world to live among us so that you and I could know him, so that we could have a relationship with God and that relationship could be restored. And he wants to forgive you. He wants to give you a forever family and he wants to give you a future with him here on earth and for eternity. If you will trust in him, I want us to pray together. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word, the power of your word. God, we ask God that you fill us with your truth and God that today we make a renewed commitment or maybe a first time commitment to say, God, I wanna build my life on a solid foundation so that I have that security and that stability in my life. God, thank you for your word. Help me to follow it to the end. And for some today, you say, today is my day. I'm ready to give my heart and my life to Jesus. I thought the Bible was just a bunch of stories, but I realized today that it is true and it is for me. And so today I wanna give my life to you, Jesus, because Jesus, you gave your life on the cross for me. And if that's you today, you can pray a prayer like this. You can say, dear Jesus, Thank you for giving your life for me. Today, I wanna to give you the pieces of my life. I don't really understand all of it, but I wanna turn from my life of self and my life of sin, and I wanna to turn to you. And I ask that you would forgive me, that you would change me. You would make me part of your family. Fill me with your spirit so that I could have power for my life. And I could live for you from now on. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name, amen.